Ahoy hoy listeners, welcome to episode 5 of the Gran Bros podcast, starring the tubular and effervescent Eddie Wardas Gomez, and myself, the perennial blonde, Tristan Roadbeef Bayless. Tonight is an off night for us, a fun cast. Who knows what's going on? Scooby-Doo up in here. Let's see what these meddling kids can get up to. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Bolide Meteors, Racing Dreams Las Vegas, and Leslie Nielsen, because why not? Eddie, how is the holographic universe treating you tonight? Hey, RBT. It's been treating me pretty well, if I understood what you were referring to, but yeah. I think it's pretty good. It's pretty sparkly, <laughs> kaleidoscopy, uh, interdimensionally. Yes, I'm having fun in this existence, in this plane of reality. How about you? Doing all right. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we got some things in mind for this podcast, but the first thing I want to know about is, dude, you drove a Ferrari race car at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. I want to hear about it. Tell me about it. Hurry up. You're not telling me about it. You need to tell me about it. Let's go. Tell me about it. It was <laughs> cool. That is all. It was pretty tight. Felt, I felt right at home, to be honest. I got into the car and I was like, yo, I feel like, uh should own this thing <laughs> master right off the bat <laughs> dude I hit i went in turn one right freaking hit the clutch you know made me go a little sideways but it didn't scare me <laughs> I, I hit the throttle the instructor was scared though he was all vomiting and stuff but uh i told him stop let me go into this corner now uh i had an amazing time <laughs> let me uh first of all say thanks <laughs> so much to Dream Racing, the uh, company that had the best Christmas party of all time. Uh, so Dream Racing is a track inside the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Or it's not a track. It, Dream Racing is in the infield track in the oval at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And I've been working there as a sim instructor for a few months. And they uh, gave us an opportunity to finally step up and do the real thing and drive one of their cars. And they gave me a selection of cars to pick from and of course i had to go with the ferrari race car because that was the car that started dream racing off initially just to give a little background dream racing was an only was only a ferrari race car driving experience place it was only until later that they added all the other cool stuff like other you know race cars like they have a cayman gt we have a 911 gt uh, Huracan, uh, the Super Trofeo Huracan is in there, and then they started adding, you know, super all kinds of supercars. We have a McLaren um, 750S and and Mercedes GTR, Nissan GTR, all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I went with the Ferrari F430 GT, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> oh my God, intense! First time ever driving a Ferrari, and it was a race car, so. Uh, incredible speed the acceleration was just so uh it, like going off of the last corner onto the main straight you know going you know dropping letting it roll all the way up to i don't even know like that's the only thing that was there was so much going on and i was so buzzed by the experience that i wasn't i have no idea how fast that was going or uh <laughs> what the rpms were i was just letting the thing rev to you know, I had I did have a little readout in front of me, and I was just trying to let that go as high as possible, because my instructor was saying, you know, pretty much having me try to short shift, but I would push that a little bit every once in a while. <clears throat> I noticed that in the video you posted, like first couple of laps, it sounded like lower RPM, and then you were increasing as you uh, went by. Was that thing a paddle shift or a six speed? Yeah, it was a paddle shifter. Sweet. It was uh, the transmission felt great. The the gear shift, it's like. You don't necessarily feel, like you definitely feel the engine, um, the power kind of shift, but it's so smooth. Other, other than that, um, going into turn one, that was probably my favorite part and highlight every time because you just dared yourself to go into it deeper and deeper. And oh man, uh, the brakes are incredible standing on them. The confidence that I had in them right away, I don't know where it came from, I guess sim racing or what, but uh, yeah, I just kept pushing it. There's a little. You know, we had to, like we have traffic cones set up with braking markers on them, mm -hmm. and the first couple times I was pretty much braking at that point. But then the third time I <laughs> went pretty deep. I didn't miss turn one, but uh, 
Yeah, I was I surprised myself with that one because I was almost, I kind of you don't really know yourself right, and that until you get to that situation, like how far will I push? Will I chicken out? And <laughs> <laughs> just how feeling, badly do you want to see Jesus? <laughs> oh, uh, not today, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, you just chill. <laughs> Chill out. Go back to that sandwich. <laughs> we'll check in with you later. <laughs> exactly, that. Uh, I was just, yeah, I went for it, and it felt great. And the Ferrari going into turn one was a very slow kind of uh, third gear. Maybe if you if you really wanted to get crazy, you could probably do it in second gear and uh, try to rev the shit out of it. But uh, it's a third gear corner of going slow and then you're coming out of it it's a it's an l it's a 90 degree left so that was really fun it was also cambered a little bit is this track uh, uh is it like an hour or not an hour uh, a mile and a half two miles what's the length of it uh the length i'm not i should know this thanks for putting me on the spot but <laughs> <laughs> no it's a minute lap so okay. it's shorter it's probably i would guess around a mile it's got some interesting cambers by the sound of it. Yeah, the first corner, yeah, but otherwise it's kind of flat. But plenty of you know, room to have fun, plenty of different variation with the cornering, and slow section in the middle was really fun, going left to right, and then a fast kind of sweeping left. It was just really fun. That car is incredible. Racing on slicks, or driving on slicks at night for the first time was just beyond words. So fun. I mean, to be honest, and if we're going to get really, like, dashboard confessional here i have to say that i was semi skeptical about you know and i'm just being honest just because uh, i'm I'm a layman and all that stuff Mm -hmm. i was like oh race cars yeah i mean it'd be fun but it's like how fun is it (laughs) Mm -hmm. let me tell you it is it it is doing that experience converts you It, it it turns it just it was like a bug bite made me want to do it way more and it's just intense fun if you ever get an opportunity to drive a race car it's not like not like many people out there would have you know any uh, be of two minds about it or anything but yeah Mm -hmm. um seek it out rather try your hardest to drive a race car if you can it is so incredibly fun it had to be pretty loud i mean it's like a race car doesn't have sound insulation it's like rattling rounds yeah, when you're just like part throttle, not even full throttle, it, it's so loud it, it demands your attention rather than something that you have to like pay attention to uh, in a, a regular street car where it's nice and comfy. Um, I bet this thing, uh, it sounds like if it was the first car that uh, Dreams Racing had, uh, must have um, had a, a lot of miles on it. Uh, I'm wondering if it had any kind of idiosyncratic sort of characteristics that uh, you weren't expecting, like uh, if... Uh, it handled a certain way you didn't expect or or if the brakes had to take a couple laps to get up to temperature were there anything anything like that going on with it not so much i mean i wasn't pushing it to that degree i don't think but it the only thing was the traction control i feel like it was turned up a bit you know if if we we're comparing it to gran turismo maybe it was at like a four you know okay so like um, very very little slip angle allowed yeah um, the only time I could get it to slip was when there's a long right-hander that's, uh, you know, medium speed, and it's a very long, constant radius corner, and I was able to get it to, to move around through there because I wasn't on, you know, I would just get up to a fast enough speed and then just kind of give the steering wheel a little, you know, jab mm-hmm. to the right, and then it would step out a little bit, and then it would be like, I'd be going hooping and hollering, mm-hmm. and then I can continue on. And then break into the next corner. That's awesome. Dance it around a little fun. bit. Yeah, just trying to see what it can do. And, uh, yeah, dude, those, that car is intense. That's radical, dude. How many laps did you do in total? It was four laps. Okay. So I had to make them count. Yeah. <laughs> Something tells me you're pretty good at that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I tried. Didn't want to spin. Although some part of me was like, I wonder what it would be like to spin in this. It might be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, $1,000 a tires later. Right. Man, but yes, had a ton of fun. I uh, hope to give more reports back on further experiences. And uh, I'm going to start doing instruction in the real cars, starting with supercars or whatever cars soon. That's so awesome. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how other people can do it. 
What's a uh, what is the sim that like you had been instructing on? What program did they use? Uh, AC or what? Well, it was actually eye racing. Oh. Yeah, since uh, there's a little bonus aspect of eye racing doing all these oval tracks, they ended up scanning the infield circuit as well. Back oh, in nice. like way back. So we have a the track. Excuse me. The track that we run is in eye racing essentially in two different configurations so you can try it out too before I got the job I actually or I went to an interview then they asked me to come back the next day and to pretty much do orientation so I got on iRacing you know got the rough uh, Porsche and uh, did a bunch of because that's like think the closest I could get to the street cars mm -hmm. that we were running mm -hmm. and ran it around the track and got to learn it that way and then I went onto the sim and did a really fast time and so that was fun to show off that a little bit isn't it cool going to some like a Peterson Automotive Museum for example where they have Forza and like the Top Gear test track in the wet set up and setting a good time because uh, like you or me we've just done sims for like at least the last 10-15 years it's cool to be kind of a um you know, we're just like regular dudes, and we just walk up, and, oh, we're just going to set the fastest time. Thank you very yeah. much. You know, have a nice day. Uh, I bet yeah. that, was, that was pretty rewarding. Oh, big time, yeah. People, it's, everyone's always skeptical, like, oh, what are you going to do in the sim? And it's always fun to exceed expectations and break, you know, perception and all that good stuff. Yeah, totally. It's one of the bonus side bonuses yeah. of it's like doing we, this thing. We've talked a lot about how... Uh, failure is so useful and not winning is so useful because it forces you to reflect and improve but uh being able to surprise uh, in in winning like conversely man that's that's like the most fun about it is is surprising people and upturning expectations uh and it's it's actually pretty rare to have those uh opportunities so dude that's awesome i'm glad that uh, that helped you secure a job there it sounds like you've already moved up pretty quickly. Uh, how long have you been there? Didn't you say it was only like seven months or something like that? Well, I've been there since late July. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fucking that's fast progress, dude. That's amazing. Thanks, and thanks for letting me talk about it at the top of the show. Letting me brag a little bit. <laughs> if you guys want to see the video, you can go to my YouTube or this YouTube. If you're on this, if you're, you know, digesting this podcast over YouTube. Uh, if you're not, it's uh, youtube.com slash wardez, W-A-R-D-E-Z. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Oh, my God. But, totally. But, uh, yeah, you can check out a little video there if you want to ask me any questions about it. Because it's hard to pull out. You know, it's like going somewhere insane and trying to relate back information. It's, there's so much to it that was just ridiculous and nuanced. uh just really cool stuff. <laughs> I just I'm, got back from Mars. How was yeah. it? It was, it was nice. You know, it was cool. It was all right. Where do I start? <laughs> all right. Yeah. What do we got? What do we got next? What's uh, what's in the lineup, my friend? Well, in the pipeline, GT Sport News is always definitely have plenty to talk about in that way. And FIA just kicked off, or not FIA. Somewhat FI, I guess. Uh, GT just kicked off its latest new season of the exhibition off season, mm -hmm. season four. New stuff is going down. The regional split has taken in has been has taken effect. We are no longer racing with our South American buddies, which is sad. It is sad. It is definitely <laughs> sad. I miss those guys. I miss them a lot. And the leaderboards are also, you know. It's funny, different people notice different things, and it tells you a lot about the way that they play the game. Some guys will be like, hey, what's up with the leaderboards? And then you'll say, oh, dude, in time trials, are you? Now it's easier to get in the top ten, isn't it? Right. Are you happy or not? I don't yes. know. It depends on the kind of driver you are. <laughs> totally. You know, seeing, seeing those Brazilian fast times would motivate me. And uh, oh, yeah. know, seeing, like, Hell's Fire and IOF Racing and Didico and uh, all those guys up there, um, Shark Art, um, TGT, um, Cristiano, and now that they're not there, uh, the big question is uh, not just me or you, but uh, at regions as a whole. If if we're not intermixing as much, are we going to be less motivated to go faster? Are we going to put, be putting in like fewer hours of practice? Are we going to be watching fewer replays? 
um, the resources available to us, particularly for replays, replays are uh, diminished. So um, uh, it's it's interesting to think of it as an experiment in seeing which, uh, like how the regions develop and, and who improves and who doesn't. And my cat is also flipping out, but you know, I think we're okay. Are we okay, cat? Yes, we're okay. All right. The cat's upset about this whole change too. I think so. You know, cat misses the Brazilians too. Um, <laughs> I, I hear they're quite revered down there, much like in ancient Egypt. But uh, you know, what do I know? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm just a guy pulling things out of my butt. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I I didn't have to go to a lobby to hang out with these guys and race them competitively. Um, but uh, who knows what the the official season has in store? The, there's several months before that happens, so maybe more changes are on the pipeline. Yeah, just like uh, we've you know we've had stuff like this happen in the past, and the best thing to do is just keep your head up, continue on. Uh, if you let it dissuade you, you're gonna miss out on something. So just keep on trucking in the yeah. free world, and who knows? Maybe they'll do some crazy cross. Uh, you know, some special event where it's like a cross regional event or something. Oh, that'd be lovely. That'd be great. So, th- I'm not saying that it's going to happen. I don't have any insider information, but I'm saying it could happen. Just keep, you know, stuff like, for example, the World Tour. Say you're not so into this new season because of the changes and you decide to sit out. Well, I guarantee you in two months they're going to say, hey, season four competitors. <laughs> If you're in the top ten, you get a free TGT or something like that. So it's a, don't don't uh, sabotage yourself. Yeah, don't discount your participation. Keep participating, and you'll get a participation ribbon from us. You'll get a gold star at least from the Tourist Bros, and and maybe more. You know, so that minimum reward is worth it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So dust off your Thrustmaster and get back to it as soon as the <laughs> holidays are over. Yeah, and happy holidays to you and all the people listening out there. Hope you guys have a great one. Just to totally. lay that out, taking those awesome uh, GT Scapes pictures with the tr- Christmas stuff in the background. Uh, so, going on over to stuff in the FI. Well, the changes we have the obviously the regional split, and then they have the new penalties, mm-hmm. uh, which were previewed in the uh, uh, live events. You're referring to the penalty zones. Yeah. 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 And I guess there's already an exploit that uh, is taking hold of the community where you can actually. I mean, I don't know how healthy it is to give this out, but if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know. But let's just say that there's a way to um, not have to slow down as much for the penalty zone. Slow it's down like a, zone. A light amount of braking as opposed to full braking, something like that. Something like that. It yeah, seems like but it's uh, dumb. It seems like exploit is the word of the month for Gran Turismo because yeah. we've got that and then some kind of like ABS glitch I hear about. Yeah, and people are using it in the <laughs> like they're getting using it to get really high up where they don't belong in region in certain regions. I think there's a British guy that just came out of nowhere with some insane speed hmm. and uh, people are attributing that to an exploit with the ABS glitch. So yeah, well, beware. If any people that have randomly found some new speed, yeah, I uh, I think that there's a thread on the GT Planet forums that Hellsfire started about uh, that ABS glitch. So yeah. uh, keep an eye out. Um, I I I hear from a lot of people, and I have heard for months that the the, the Polyphony guys will kind of keep an eye on these forums. So you know, uh, let's uh, give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that they've got a fix uh, in the works. Um, I, I think that they probably will uh, shut down this exploit. But uh, what is racing but looking for the unfair advantage at all times? So can't knock these guys, but uh, I think it, it is good that we brought it up. We want everyone to be informed. So, um, you know, just the game develops rather than remain stagnant. Yeah. And uh, tell us what you feel about, or I mean, tell us how your experience has been with the new regional splits for instance in australia they've broken off from the rest of asia whereas previously they were together and now people are saying that there are hardly any you know depending on the time of course and all that stuff it's difficult to find full rooms for sport daily races and stuff so it is you know i've i've done i think like three daily races since the update and uh 
in uh, two out of three, I was the only S driver in the daily race. Um, I did them in the middle of the day, um, Pacific time. Uh, and then the third race had uh, maybe half the grid were either S or A+. Plus. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was diminished. You know, what can I say? It's, it's like uh, I feel like I don't have a right to complain about it. Um, I I have to say it's disappointing, but it's it's maybe disappointing because I don't know yet how to best interpret it, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, and I think that giving it time might be the best because here's the thing: what if the regional splits uh, have altered the way that DR driver driver ranking is calculated? And maybe within a few weeks we might have a bunch of people who are like C or B elevated to A plus. Uh, you know, pending that they're not just crashing into everybody, so this could be this could be a temporary setback, uh, maybe not the new norm, but just like a, a temporary trend. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Keep our ears to the ground and watch those GC Planet forums, so those other nerds can tell us what's up. For sure. <laughs> but uh, and then the only thing else I wanted to touch on was I don't know how I feel about this yet. I didn't participate in the first round. I, was, I wasn't able to, but. People are now able to do multiple round, uh, multiple st- time slots, which is interesting, right? Mm-hmm. I, you know, some I think Nico did all five somehow, but I'm not sure exactly how that works when it when you split your time between um, nations and manufacturers. Yeah, it's you know, um, if it seems like if you tried to do both nations and manufacturers, you could probably get three of one and two of the other in, since we got like five right. slots per day. Um, and I understand the trade-off is a on the the, the pro side, you get uh, the best result possible for points, and on the the con side, uh, the more races you do, the likelier it is that you're going to be in an incident of some kind. That's going to lower your driver ranking or safety rating. And what if you have two races that uh, you know, things go awry and uh, you knock your rating down, and then your third race on the same day, you're now just ranked with like C drivers, D drivers, or something like that. And now the points table, instead of 2,000 points, it's 600 points, or even less than that. So you're shooting yourself in the foot by trying to do all five races rather than uh, focusing in and uh, committing yourself to just one race. Um, I think it's going to be apples and oranges. It's going to be different things for different people. Um, I think that. The opening up of the choice is a good thing, ultimately, because um, uh, less choice is is just worse. So uh, we'll take it as it comes. Um, I have also missed the race, but I think uh, Saturday and next Wednesday I'm probably going to be able to make them. We'll see how it goes, but uh, I, I, for one, am in support of the change in that regard. Yeah, a uh, bonus that I would see is that you're now going to be able to more easily race people that you want to so before it would you would ask someone hey what slot are you doing and they said oh i already raced so i can't race with you blah 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 yes now you know if they were willing you can say well you want to do the race again and race me this time let's go for it and that's kind of that's kind of cool so they think there's more opportunity for you to find your friends online for the fia stuff I which agree. is a good thing uh, I did also hear this quick note about, um, I don't know if this is was just like a temporary thing, but supposedly there were some people that were accumulating points uh, for every race rather than just getting getting their best score. Oh, like applied. a scoring glitch or something? Yeah. So hopefully that's been fixed. It's funny. But moving on. So now we're going to go into a little game. We're going to try a little, something a little different. This is going to be... What? Word association, you know, word association, your fifth grade, you know, teacher probably did it with you or whatever. Uh, but if you don't know, it's uh, we're going to give off a word. We both have pre- pre-written a uh, group of words. We're going to, one of us is going to shout them out. Another one is supposed to react with their first word that comes to their mind. Mm-hmm. Very simple. That's going to reveal a lot about our characters, our inner sin sinners oh and all that stuff yeah oh boy am i am i ready to reveal my inner self to you <laughs> i don't know that's what it's, this is all about i think you're ready though i've, I've seen other things so I, i'm ready for this <laughs> yes you have <laughs> all right uh let's blossom together my friend 
All right. So I'll go first. Are you ready? I'm ready. Exhaust. Titanium. Titanium. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty color. Okay. You ready for mine? Yep. Tyrol. Ken. Mm. Okay. Accurate. I like it. <laughs> I had to say it fast because, uh, yeah. Okay. Germany. Hmm. <laughs> Mm. You responded uh, with an emotion. I like that one. I did. Uh, uh, the Radical Protestant Reformation. Because <laughs> I just nice. read about it on Wikipedia, and it was it was crazy. It was like a societal upturn when Martin Luther translated the Latin Bible into German uh, for the first time, and uh, the public like went crazy because they realized that they were all being kind of lied to. And uh, it started the Protestant Reformation, and basically, like, there were just wars going on all over Europe because of it, uh, as everyone was, like, suddenly enlightened to uh, how, uh, how much of the Bible was left out uh, when they went to church. People uh, were mad. Thanks a lot, Martin. You just yeah. ruined everything. Yeah, and here's the thing is that Martin Luther uh, reveled in it. He was a very vulgar guy, and he, he enjoyed witnessing the chaos that he sowed. <laughs> I love it. What a side note in history that we got from that one word. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm ready um, for mine. Andrea Moda. Oh, the worst. The uh, cocaine cowboys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, doing things the cool way. So Andrea Moda was like the worst F1 team of all time. If I didn't know, if I didn't know about F1 history, I would say, is that like a cool cologne or something? I it think they like a cologne. they made Italian uh, shoes. They're like oh, uh, yes. the sneakers or or soccer shoes or something like that. Uh, pop quiz, real pop quiz about uh, quick pop quiz about Andrea Moda. Um, what was significant about one of their two drivers? Uh, I mean, like both drivers had significant yeah, went to about jail, them, but no, uh, no. You're thinking of Bertrand Gachot. That uh, was the one who uh, sprayed mace on a London taxicab driver, which and, allowed uh, Michael Schumacher. Schumacher yeah. Yep. Um, Perry McCarthy, my man. Perry McCarthy, the first Stig in the Top Gear. Oh, yeah. The black Stig, the one who You're died right. by driving off of an aircraft one. carrier. <laughs> yeah. Not really. Don't worry, <laughs> yes. folks. Not not really. But, yes. Yeah, go look that episode up. That was a good one. He was one of the two drivers for Andrea Moda. That's, that's really interesting. Nice, nice side note there. Yeah, but uh, Andrea Moda, what an interesting story. If you haven't, there's a website called F1 Rejects. It's, oh my gosh. Oh, it's a lovely best. website. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily hosted anymore on its original host uh, it's, platform. It's out but, there. If, if it's, it's out not, there, it's, it's got to be like in the, you know, the uh, World Wide Web Wayback Machine or something. I'm sure you can pull it up. Yeah. So well written. The story, I mean, somebody needs to turn that into a little movie or something. But okay. Your turn, so, my man. Nos. <laughs> Fast and the Furious, of course. Oh, Paul Walker's beautiful locks. Yes, Nos. I need, I need Nos. I need it tonight. <laughs> you got oh. a lead foot. Yep. You can't handle it. <laughs> oh, that's. Oh, what a great movie. Oh, I remember seeing that movie in theaters when it came out. Me too. I saw it with my brother, and uh, he was driving a uh, an '83 Volkswagen Rabbit GTI, and I had my 1990 oh. Volvo 240DL. So oh, two of like the, the slowest cars uh, <laughs> ever, ever to like grace American soil. 13 seconds, zero to 60 or something like that. Nevertheless, we left that theater and we raced at every stoplight on the way home. Um, I hope my parents aren't <laughs> oh listening, but you know, we're still alive and the cars were in one piece. So nothing happened, mom and dad. But, uh, oh gosh, that was a cultural phenomenon, that movie. Oh, yeah, dude. It inspired my love for cars even more. I was already kind of into it, but that that really jumped it to the next level. <laughs> nice. It really made me fall in love with uh, the <laughs> idea of the whole Supra scene and all that. I even like the Eclipse. I still like that Eclipse a lot. That w that Eclipse was pretty sweet. And, yeah. like, they, I, I liked the attention to detail in sound design in that movie, that they had all the, the blow-off valve chirps and the turbo whooshes and the exhaust. Yeah. Uh, pop backs and flames and stuff and of course it was 
Hollywood and deliberately overdone, but it was uh, it was it was like they started with an accurate baseline and then turned it to eleven, and I appreciated that. Yeah, me too. And it was funny. Some I forgot who brought it up. I saw it somewhere, but remember the guy that was playing Gran Turismo in his car? Yeah, and somehow started? crashed on turn one at high <laughs> speed so ring? Terrible. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll raise my hand in guilt for that one, dude. I've, plenty of times. It wasn't. I didn't start out this good, trust me. Uh, but yeah, that was, I forget what car he was in. I think it was the car that he was in. Because uh, he was like in an Integra, maybe? In the it it might have been an Integra. It might have been like a 3000 GT or something. That's funny. Pardon me. <coughs> oh, nice one. Excuse me. Word association for that? Delicious. All right. Yep. But <laughs> All right. Uh, the, it's here. funny, though. Just a quick note beside before you give your word. Uh, it's sad that now people, <laughs> kids, you know, maybe like sub 18 year olds think NOS is just a drink. Moving on. <laughs> a tasty, a tasty energy drink. It is drink. good. Got to admit, it's it's one of the more delicious energy drinks. Um, it is, of course, overly sugary. But, um, I mean, it's better than, I hate to say it, but it's better than Monster. It's better than Rockstar. It's maybe not quite as good as Red Bull, but it's like second fiddle to Red Bull. And it's in that awesome NOS-looking bottle, the blue bottle with the orange awesome. top. The, yeah, it's, it's got something going on. It's, it's well marketed. You're making Lewis Hamilton sad. But this podcast presented to you by the NOS Drinks Company. Excellent. Get NOS. Get boosted. <laughs> well done. All right, you ready? Yeah. Habanero. Closing. Mm, deliciousness. <laughs> uh, $20. Uh, it made me think, whenever I think of, actually, it was fire. It was, it was a bet. So my favorite, my words should have been bet because I was bet $20 by my mom to eat one whole. Yeah, and how'd you do? I, I did it, man. It was like hot ones back in 1994 or whatever it was. <laughs> Did you uh, did you succumb to it in any way? Were you like curled up in a ball, or were you uh, you know? A oh, man? No more, no amount of water or milk could help, man. It was just uh, not worth it. Yeah, twenty bucks was way too low. <laughs> I really needed to bargain that up. Gotcha. It was it was at least a forty dollar pain ordeal. <laughs> you know what's popular these days for like chicken wings is mango habanero. Oh, sauce. I love mango habanero sauce, dude. It's in it's the shit, man. So I need good. to make a uh, mango habanero livery for GT Sport. That would be off the hook. That would be fiery, delicious, hot. Okay. I'm ready. My body is ready. Drifter. Mm. Mm. Jared Thompson. <laughs> not <laughs> a word, a not a name that you would recognize, but... Um, I thought of a lot of famous names, and I'm like, wait, what's like a who's a drifter that's actually a little less known but extremely talented? So uh, Jared Thompson, he uh, he runs, I think, the uh, Pikes Peak International Raceway Driving School, and wow. he was at the Jim Russell Mechanics Training Program with me in 2002, 2003. He was one of the upperclassmen, a senior to my junior, because they uh, had a year-long class that rotated every six months. The uh, students, so there's always like a senior class and a junior class that overlapped. And nice. Uh, he he was like an aspiring driver uh, when we were there, and uh, kind of was working on his craft. I wouldn't say he was winning races, but he had a lot of promise. Started doing a lot of rally cross, uh, and then he uh, went to he actually uh, stayed with Jim Russell when they were bought by Sim Raceway, and I think became like their chief instructor. And then moved to Colorado with his family uh, and is now like the chief instructor at Pikes Peak International Raceway. And all I see on his Facebook are just amazing drifts in like 370Zs and nice. S2000s. And the guy is incredibly talented. So, uh, yeah, dude, that's my response. Big shout I'm out. I'm going to look him up. Yeah, what's his name again? Jared Thompson. Jared Thompson. He's an awesome he's gonna guy. Get, he's going to get thousands of followers now. He better. He Thanks deserves us. All right. Yeah. You ready? Yes. Here it comes. Feynman. Oh, uh, my daddy. Oh, sorry. It came out, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that would be, you'd be extra super famous, and it would, it would explain why you're so effing smart. 
Ah, well, I do know quantum physics like the back of my hand. Um, uh, yeah, Richard Feynman, one of the uh, greatest philosophers, science uh, popularizers of all time, and genius mathematician, physicist, and he's got one of the coolest voices ever. I've, I've seen, I've listened, to, I've fell asleep to so many of his lectures and stuff. It's uh, he's he's awesome, and he's. He's got a little extra, he's got like an edge of woo-woo to him where he kind of, every once in a while, gets a little spiritual like Carl Sagan and stuff, but mm-hmm. uh, which I really appreciate. And yeah, man, he's an awesome dude from uh, the East Coast, I think, like New York area. Yeah, he's and got that like Brooklyn was, accent going on. Was part of the Los Alamos, you know, building the bomb kind of deal, Manhattan Project, I think. Yeah. I and think he was a chief investigator, one of the chief investigators uh, to the Challenger explosion when that oh, thing wow. uh, failed and to, to figure out like where, um, you know, down the chain of command, what happened, like why, why was it launched in 35 degree weather, et cetera. Um, yeah, but what would I always associate with that, that <clears throat> name, because it's so famous now in such a, a part, you know, a specific way. But whenever I hear it, it just feels relief, relieving, relieving rather. So because whenever I hear other names relating, you know, in the science world or whatever, it's a lot of time it can be kind of cold and like you're like you're just all you are is respectful. But his name brings up like a warmth, kind of warm kind of energy, which I really like and dig. Cool. So yeah, very good. So I'm my ready. next one. Let's do it. Chicane. Casio Triangle, Suzuka, there is no other. The most famous <laughs> chicane, right? It's pretty nice. That was the the Prost and Senna duel and clash in 1989, I think it was. Yeah, it, it was 89. Uh, two of them came together, and uh, Prost went for um, just a regular driving line, and Senna went for a gap that he saw there, and uh, could be argued if Prost did it deliberately. But so they both stalled, and Senna then got a push start, took the slip road, and won the race. Was later disqualified because he took the slip road, which uh, apparently was a rule that it could be argued was made up by Balestre after the race to uh, favor Prost. But man, that was like one of the greatest racing controversies. So, um, yeah, dude, that's a, that's a chicane of infamy. Yeah, definitely one of the more intense chicanes when it comes to trying to get alongside someone because uh, you're right there at the finish line going downhill after it and yeah the passes any passing attempts to go down there are always pretty hairy it can be my one of my favorite passes ever though was uh, hulkenberg i think 2017 the famous <laughs> see ya pass. see ya later <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was sick uh, i like his attitude i like hulkenberg's attitude yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, but yeah, chicanes in general are, uh, man, there's some pretty infamous ones. Although I, One that I really like a lot is the Daytona bus stop, even though it's not in the game sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bus stop chicanes are really cool, especially super fast ones. It is a very fast one. It's got to be like one of the fastest. You're going in after, you're probably like topping out at your car's, uh, you know, red line and sixth or something. And you go in there and you're only dropping like a couple of gears, but you got to keep decelerating because it gets tighter at the exit. That is tricky. Yeah. And it, it takes cojones. My, my least favorite is probably the one that's coming up for the next round of manufacture, I think, which is Yamagiwa Reverse. Uh, that chicane. <laughs> it's terrible. I hate that chicane. And you mean like the, the right, left, limit. right chicane? It's like it, you uh, descend the yeah. hill. And it kind of bottoms out. You do a little chicane, and then it goes back uphill again. Oh, in the reverse, it's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Or are you, are you talking about the chicane that's after like the first turn? Oh um, yeah, after it's like in the middle. It's like yeah, sector two or whatever in the middle of the track, right before you go uphill into the fast part. Regardless, Yamagawa's got some serious track limits. Yeah, not gonna be fun, I don't think. But okay, moving on to mine. Walkinshaw. Oh, sorry. Say that again. <laughs> Walkinshaw. 
Are you familiar? Uh, uh, how about how sounds about, like a? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. It just sounds like a a German uh, driver. So, uh, Tom Walkinshaw. Somewhat. You will have to brighten me up. On All right. That one. Quick, quick brightening. Quick, a uh, quick little spotlight. So, uh, TWR, uh, as you may be familiar with, is a racing team that existed through the eighties and nineties. They campaigned the Jaguar XJR9 at Le Mans. They built the XJR15. They built and campaigned the Arrows Formula One team up until ah. its uh, its dissolvement in 2003, I think. And Tom Walkinshaw was the man behind it all. Oh, awesome. I have not paid too much. Uh, I haven't really rec- um, seen around too much. I think I've heard the name some, a few times, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's okay that it's, it's not known because he was apparently a very abrasive character. I think he passed away a few years ago. But, um, you know, he was... Um, very successful for for a long time cool well next one for you is penalty <sighs> man i gotta bring up uh the the repercharge the the yeah. willow springs the f-250 raptor Ooh. The penalty that uh, ended my dreams. Um, you know, my myself and Karatsa going into turn one, I thought I left him enough room. You know, I've reviewed the replay, and it looks like I might not have hit him at all. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it looked like I hit him, and maybe I hit him. And I was on a short leash uh, after hitting Nick McMillan in the uh, block race pretty hard and getting away with just a warning. So, uh, yeah, it just sucks. I wish I had known about the penalty zone exploit at that time. <laughs> because then I could have come back. Oh, well. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to scream. That's what I'm out the window. <laughs> well, you know, when, when emotions take hold, then, uh, <laughs> you know, a uh, 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 sincere volume reveals itself. No, I love the passion. I love it. Uh, yeah, regrettable penalty uh Sore subjects, yes. It's it's a sore subject, but I'm able to talk about it because I I accept my responsibility. You know. Yes. It's like how Very else mature. how else am I going to be able to reflect and improve? That's that's the whole goal, right? It's the superior organism. You you want to evolve. The yes. that that dangerous word evolution. It's like well, you want to get better. <laughs> Only one way. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. condemn yourself to the history book. So. Yeah, dude, exactly. I, I'm I'm okay with the results. Uh, it's uh, I don't want to wax poetic for too long, but the end result is I'm doing a podcast with you, and I couldn't be happier. So there you go. Nice, appreciate that. That's cool. All right, mine no, mine. Give me mine. Uh, I don't think less of you for mispronouncing it earlier, but it's correctly pronounced roof. There you go. I'm always down to learn how stuff's pronounced. Enjoyment. Your reaction, sir. Roof. Oh well. I thought about the roofs being on fire, but when I realized <laughs> we were talking about the Porsche, uh, I think about oh wait, Porsche. Porsche that's way too powerful. A Porsche that's just too powerful for its own good. That's, uh Yeah. And I guess fun, but also super frightening and hard to control. And I also think a lot about <clears throat> the Yellowbird um, doing runs around the Nurburgring in GT4 and the Yellowbird, which is pretty intense. Yeah. Uh, fun. Fun. I mean, it, it was also, I would say, associ- I, was, I would associate it, associate it with uh, like desperation in the sense, oh, maybe that's not the best word, but it, it was the only way that we were able to get any sort of portion to Gran Turismo for a very long time. So mm-hmm. it was, a, it was a, it was a good loophole that they were able to get through, get it them was. in through. It was great that in GT2, they had like um, five different roofs 
um, from different eras. They had like the CTR2, the CTR2 Sport, the BTR2, which is probably the one they made the fewest of, the BTR2. Uh, the the BTR from the 80s, the uh, um, CTR Yellowbird, of course. Um, that was like three different generations of 911 right there. So, uh, I mean, like, for for a workarounds when Porsche were exclusively in, like, the Need for Speed contract, I think, for two decades, which was ridiculous, by the way, for shame, Porsche. Big dick. Um, Big shame. I think that was it was quite successful of Cavs to, to score that. Um, there was a Porsche GT3 hidden in Gran Turismo 3, wasn't there? Along with, like, a Mercedes DTM car. If you used, like, a... a uh, a game genie or something like that you can unlock them is that right yeah i'll have to pass that along to our research team i don't know offhand right now but yeah pretty sure that i remember something to do with that that may may or may not have been in the game mm-hmm. uh all right next word sir yeah yes uh forza mm. forza You know, what's the first word? Controllers. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> oh, man. Because the, how many steering wheels exist for the Xbox system? Like one? Well, yeah, there's not official. There's no official wheel anymore, but they do have Fanatec, Fanatec support, rather. Okay. Um. They have a couple. I think they have a CSL and then a newer one. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not a lot of people are rocking wheels. There's no budget kind of... Well, no, there's the G... There is a Logitech G something something 920? Something like that. G20 290? Well, that, that one works on it. Did I hear that it was some uh, competition or league that uh, disallows wheels and you have to use a controller? Enforcing. Yeah, it's very common. It's, there's a, I don't, I'm not quite, you know, I wish we had Def's on here. Maybe he could break it down for us a little better. But um, from what I remember, back when I was kind of heavy in the GT4, or er, Forza 4 and Forza 5 days, or no, Forza 4 and 6, I skipped 5. Um, they, they're mostly people are using controllers. Um, and there was, bec- it was mostly because of the weird feeling that wheels get would have like your steering wasn't always it didn't always feel right it felt like there was some hidden assist going on Hmm. and it didn't feel pure it didn't feel like it's just it wasn't there was something off about it i don't even it's still hard to describe but it was definitely there and people a lot of people preferred to use even if they were they had a wheel and were good with the wheel they would just go use controllers Mm -hmm. which you know i'm it's it's fine i guess but I don't know. I don't. I don't like being like a snob or whatever. But I just prefer uh, wheel, and it would be nice if you're racing other people with wheels because it's just cool. Well, I don't think you're a snob. I think <laughs> I think that we've got an activity driving that is performed thus far only exclusively with a steering wheel, and yet we have competitions for a racing driving game that disallow the very appliance used to operate it in real life. It's like that's cognitive dissonance. And uh, I I agree with you that it's a little weird. Um, and if, X, if, if Microsoft and Forza want to be taken as seriously as iRacing or Gran Turismo, I think they're going to need to really push steering wheels. Um. Yeah, that's my piece. So, uh, you ready for your next word? Yep. Succulence. Um. Yeah, chocolate covered strawberries. <laughs> In Monaco. In Monaco. That's very specific. Yeah. I saw pictures. No, just kidding. Oh boy. Were there other things that were chocolate covered? Uh, there's some chocolate covered no-nos, yeah. (laughs) 
Is that code for something, or am I just ignorant? Both. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the stuff that dreams are made of. <laughs> All right, dude, yes. hit me. I'm ready. All right. All right. First word that comes to mind. Right. B-O-P. McLaren. <laughs> nice. It's definitely not balanced. Not quite. You know, that's it's a great car, that like 650S. Goes into a corner so deep, but is absolutely helpless getting out of a corner. And only has power in like the last... 200 RPM of its rev band. It's kind of a shame. Yeah. BLP, uh, for people, uh, for the one or two people that may not know, it's balance of performance, and it's a way of getting the cars to race each other on an even level, in theory. Uh, it's been done in racing series for a while in real life, and we used to do it all the time in GT5 and 6 on our own uh, to try to get you know all the gt500 cars or all the whatever cars to play nice with each other on track but it's always been so tough i thought back in the day not, like having a getting a pop that was you know something where you, you had the cars going within five tenths of each other was good and i think that's about as good as things can get i thought that you know professional you know I mean, I just anticipated when I heard that there was BLP for GT Sport, I was like, oh, they're going to nail it, no problem. Mm -hmm. But even for them, it's difficult. So, Yeah, there have been a lot of tire model changes, um, throttle map changes. Um, I've noticed that since the, the update in like uh, August or September, or just before the, the official FIA championship, uh, a lot of cars like bog at low RPM. They go, they like chug. Uh, below, I don't know, what, like 3,000 RPM or something like that. It used to be that you could take uh, a Viper, uh, Group 4, Group 3, through the hairpin in Sector 2 at Suzuka in third gear and power out very nicely and just have, like, great power from low end. And now you can't because the car is like, go, 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 go. It doesn't want to accelerate. It's um, it's cool that they're introducing things that are, are kind of realistic, but they're still, like, quasi-realistic. So... Uh, I echo your sentiment. It's like, you know, your Gran Turismo are going to do it as best they can and are going to probably be pretty accurate, but um, we can see even now that uh, the closer you get to realism, the harder it is to really reach it fully. Yeah. And I do appreciate that, you know, certain cars are going to do better in different tracks and stuff, but it, it gets pretty muddy when you have a, like, for instance, to the final season of the manufacturer season or series, and you know the very first one the last race which counted for the most points was inner lagos so certain cars had a big advantage there um i'm all for having bop for different tracks too it's like why not yeah i mean we can adjust it with one round to the next some of them like the the tokyo layout with the super long straightaway um everybody uses the Peugeot vgt because it's got the great top ends. So, uh, yeah, BOP, track by track, if they had the staff to arrange for such a thing, why not? Yeah. Are you ready for your words? Mm-hmm. Vandenberg. Wow. Uh, that's, uh, it reminds me of pretty things, really nice sunsets and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, just stuff that I can't mention on this uh, podcast. Uh oh. Yeah. That'll yeah. So Vandenberg is a great name. It's a very, you know, um, <laughs> what's that word? I, I did have a word. I forgot it though. Or, or it was a really good one. I, I forget. What, it'll probably come back to me later on. Uh, impressive is is is, is kind of like. The gist of it. <laughs> the gist. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks for that one. It made me blush. <laughs> it might have been unintentional, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to fist pump anyway. So. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's just talking about some 
I might have discovered an Eddie's secret. You have? Well, it wasn't a secret. I told you about it. It was a particular uh, kind of... Okay, Vandenberg is a car. It's a great car. It has humongous power. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, maybe. It's also an Air Force base. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Top Gun. Uh, uh, 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, uh, cannons. <laughs> yep. I told uh, you that in confidence. Did you? I don't. I'm going to claim ignorance on this one, my friend. Okay, cool. I'll tell you about it after the show. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. You know, that's the stuff that dreams are made of. Yeah, boy. <laughs> All right, my turn. My turn. My turn. My turn. Yeah. It's NASCAR. NASCAR? NASCAR. Hmm. Intimidator. Intimidator. You know, that's. Uh, He's he's the hero I grew up with. He's Ke- uh, Kyle Bush. Kyle Bush, dude, back fifing gezeked. That is a face that needs to be slapped <laughs> at all times. <laughs> you know he's probably a cool guy. You know in the background, it was Kyle Bush who who got uh, Kimi Raikkonen to drive NASCAR. Yeah. It was like Kyle Bush racing or whatever that he did a, a Craftsman truck and like a Bush Series race in. So mm-hmm. you know, hats off to him, but. Uh, you know his entrec- hmm. antics do not in, uh, <laughs> endear him to those of us who otherwise were uh, more akin to the likes of the Intimidator, someone who's you know soft spoken and carries a big stick. Yeah, you're talking about Dale Earnhardt. Oh yeah, the man, one tough customer. Yeah, really amazing driver. Uh, Dale Earnhardt was on Joe Rogan's podcast recently. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Not <laughs> we haven't because gotten to that point. The hologram of Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> you know, man, yep. technology's come a long way. First Tupac, now Earnhardt. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. The, Tupac, uh, the Dale Earnhardt hologram does an entire Joe Rogan <laughs> podcast. I think that'll be the jumping the shark moment where Joe goes a little too crazy. The Dale Earnhardt hologram is in trouble because he just spun out the, the Mike Skinner hologram. <laughs> so, Dale can't believe you're dead man what do you think about bears <laughs> yeah i hunt them in the afterlife and then after that i have a brewski and then uh, i go win some races i go to riverside <laughs> because it's in it's in heaven now too doesn't oh, exist anymore you know you I, bring a tear to my eye i race daryl daryl wild trip at riverside and it's it's good times man <laughs> I do not sound like Dale Earnhardt at all, and I'm probably tarnishing his legend by even trying oh, yeah. to imitate him. But yeah, yeah, he's gonna shun you. That guy was something life. else. So, yeah, uh, you ready for your word, my friend? It, yep. This will be a, a bit of a departure. Mozart. Uh, think about deafness and doing things what you doing the thing that you love, even if you are have it. Um, taken away from you uh, in a big way it, or have or when life tries to take something away from you you continue on and mm-hmm. do some of your best work like Mozart interesting you know at his deafness that that perseverance uh, that lesson is important um, but you might be thinking of Beethoven Beethoven was it yeah oh damn <laughs> <laughs> it's okay do it it's all right because uh uh, uh, Mozart, his his study, the person he looked up to was Bach, um, J.S. Bach, and Beethoven. Beethoven, who he looked up to, was Mozart. So they are, like, uh, ultimately interconnected. And so uh, you were not far off at all. Um, yeah. and, and that message of perseverance is very important because Beethoven <laughs> went deaf and uh, clenched, like, uh, uh, a tool between his teeth that was hooked to, like, his piano to hear the music that he was writing um, and secluded himself, but nevertheless, like, wrote some of his best work when he was already, like, completely deaf, uh, you know, so your message is not lost. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear. Yeah, at least we can get some of that side note stuff going. Uh, he's, uh, he's not really, I, I listen to a ton of music, but classical is something that I've never, I, I've, I enjoy it, but I don't really pursue it, so. 
but definitely in, I find this in, the story is interesting. And I did I did also think of the movie. Was it wasn't there a movie that um, Hitchcock made, or was it someone else? No, I don't think it was Hitchcock. I don't or know not Hitchcock, Hitchcock, rather. I mean, I'm trying. I'm thinking of a different. You might. This word association has got me. Uh, are you thinking, thinking of uh, Amadeus? Amadeus, yes. It's from like 1982 or something like that. Yeah, and that was that was about Mozart and uh, his rivalry with Salieri. Yeah, a surprisingly funny movie. I've seen clips of it. I need to sit down and try to watch it one day. Lovely movie. Mr. Rooney yeah. from Ferris Bueller's Day Off plays the Austrian king in that movie. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's something else. Awesome. So this will be. You gave your tenth word, didn't you? Uh, no, that was my ninth word. Ninth. Okay. So my final word is going to be... Final Jeopardy. Parsec. Hmm. The Kessel Run. Less than 12 parsecs. Am I right? Yeah, of course. Parsec is a unit of measurement, not a measurement of speed for those uninitiated. Uh, a parsec, I think, is, uh, what is it? Is it like uh, four and a half light years or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact, but um, it's supposed to, yeah, it was a, a thing It was a thing that Han, Han Solo liked to brag about because the Millennium Falcon was able to get through the castle run and four parsecs yeah, I think or something like uh, that 3.26 light years in length yeah so if yeah, a castle run was prob- I think it was supposed to be like a, a run through an asteroid field and like a, a destroyed solar system and like nebulas and uh, radiation and, and the kind of stuff that his sensors would like any normal uh, ship would not be able to navigate uh, conventionally so they would have to take the long way around, much like how a commercial pilot would need to detour around a big thunderstorm. If they can minimize the route, then they get to the airport on time, and they minimize the fuel they've used, and they minimize the uh, agony of their um, passengers. Uh, so if, if Han Solo has done it in less than 12 parsecs, then holy crap, that guy's found like several shortcuts, not just one, but many that no others have found. Uh, and been able to navigate it through, uh, you know, all sorts of deadly obstacles, um, you know, such as the uh, uh, greatness of his accomplishment. So uh, thank you for that last word. Are you ready for your last word, my friend? Yeah. Ah, it's a little self-indulgent, so I apologize. Here it comes. Harry Bow. Uh, well, I think of the best... Uh, gummy candy that exists and nothing else tastes quite like it and a certain you know Tristan got obsessed with it and I think for good reason because that stuff's delicious and it's nutritious is there a type of Harry Bow gummy that you might call your favorite because there are many varieties oh yeah just the gummy bears for sure have you sampled uh, other flavors that they have such as like <laughs> the, the the cola gummies or the the oh, yeah, yeah, the gummies. tropical. I like the tropical ones. Okay. It's a solid mango and all that, pineapple. They have a, uh, a Wineland series of gummies that's all kind of like muscat grape flavors. Um, can't buy it in the States. You have to import it, but it is out of this world good. It in actually fact, has uh, some in it. You did? In England, yeah. Well, tell me your thoughts! <laughs> well... Uh, it was funny because it was during GT Academy, and I we went we were on a trip somewhere, and we stopped at this gas station. And I was like, "Oh, what wine gummies? What do they have alcohol in them?" <laughs> <laughs> and I picked them up, and I took them to the uh, van with like a bunch of the other guys. And I was like, "Hey, good dudes, found some candy that has alcohol in it." And before I could you know before I could even finish <laughs> that sentence, really, one of the guys grabbed it out of my hand and was like, oh, "Dude, let's get let's get messed up on this stuff," and started <laughs> passing it around. And we were like, oh, it just tastes kind of bad, but I don't think it's alcoholic. <laughs> I don't think that's very possible. I wouldn't, they didn't ask me for anything, so yeah, that was just funny. That's funny. But, uh, yeah. 
I wonder if a couple of them got uh, got hiffy just by on a uh, placebo effect. That can totally happen. People can get drunk uh, off non-alcoholic stuff. The power of the mind is crazy. The mind makes it real. If you believe you're fast, you are sometimes. Excuse me. Gotta well, that's that. uh, that's my tenth word, my dude. Awesome. So that what do you fun. think? It went on a, a little long, but that's fine. What do you think about uh, that NROL 71 scrubbed launch that was canceled at seven seconds to lift off because of a hydrogen leak? Um, I still need to... You can probably fill me in on that, and I'll let you know, because I haven't actually figured out what ha- went wrong. Uh, you know as much as I know now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, what well, was interesting, those four launches that were supposed to go on at, uh, on Wednesday, was it? Yeah, or and yesterday? like all of them were scrubbed. Yeah, because of weather or whatever. It's uh, crazy. You're getting there, man. It's going to start, it's starting to become more and more kind of routine, right? Which is cool. It is. It's great that it's becoming commonplace. Um, but it also feels like people are trying to catch up to SpaceX progress, too, which can be a bad thing. Yeah, you don't want them to rush. Um, uh, I I do think of Bezos and New Shepard, and I think of uh, Virgin Galactic, and they're they're maybe overly ambitious, even though their targets are not as high as SpaceX, who are you know legitimately launching commercial satellites and payloads and things to like the International Space Station and a geosynchronous orbit, whereas New Shepard is just going up and down. And Virgin Galactic is just going up and down. Um, uh, they're admirable, and it's cool. It's super cool. And their first steps to uh, like a commercial endeavor for uh, passengers who have you know a quarter mil. Uh, you want to buy a 911 Turbo or you want to go to space? It's actually kind of a reasonable question now, uh, and I'm I, I'm so happy that it's within the grasp of uh, the moderately wealthy rather than the super wealthy. Uh, and and hopefully with uh, with time and hopefully a short amount of time it'll become available to um, you know those who maybe save up for a year or two and now like you and I can go to space that'd be amazing uh, on the other hand I think uh, I agree with you wholly that uh, maybe they're going a little too fast and uh, they should really be sure of their safety uh, that that Virgin Galactic spaceship one uh, although impressive if you watch its uh, onboard camera, the rear-facing one particularly, as it's ascending, um, increasing its pitch to straight up, basically, and you see the smoke plume behind it, the smoke plume is very zigzaggy. Like, this thing has a lot of pitch left and right. It's not really stable. It does not have any thrust vectoring. It's something that's, uh, it's like, you know, it would take just one big gust of wind and the thing's going to break apart. Um, yeah, that, that kind of stuff does worry me. Yeah, they're going to have to do, you know, if you, if you watch the theme park when it's first opening up, they run roller coasters with uh, these, like, sandbag kind of dummies inside them, and they run them forever, you know, just over and over and over again until anything wrong mm-hmm. can happen, and that's what's going to have to happen. I think it's pretty early for space tourism, I mean, especially when we don't have, we don't even have supersonic uh, passenger jets going. Yes, which is very um, disappointing. So... There's a lot, like it's still it's gonna be like a novelty, you know. People are gonna go up, which is great. I, I fully support it, but it's kind of weird to think that all these rich people um, that are very, you know, enamored with the idea of going to space are gonna be almost like cannon fodder, or they're gonna be like the first line to go up. And I think a few of them are gonna die, and not, not to be, you know, I mean that's just the price to pay for going to space. It's a serious thing. It's a serious. Uh, there are very serious consequences, and. Uh, those people that go up are super brave and awesome for being one of the first and it's going to get hairy but I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how it progresses and I think the ultimate I, the ultimate thing which I think is really cool is having like some sort of semi-permanent habitat that's in orbit around around Earth mm-hmm. and eventually around the moon or something like that the more the better you know we have to worry about uh, what is it Kessler syndrome where there's too much debris uh, in low Earth orbit, orbit to safely escape low or Earth orbit. It's hard to say those words together. But um, totally, dude. If the more habitats, the more space stations, the better. 
if we can get space stations to like a Lagrange point between the Earth and the Moon, um, you know, we can start thinking about crazy stuff like space elevators. What? Um, yeah. But yeah, like I, I agree that um, the first celebrities who decide to go on New Shepard or Virgin Galactic are going to, half of them are going to know what they're up against and are going to be ready to risk their life. And the other half are going to be like, oh, I was just, this looks amazing. And I just want, you know, the Instagram views and the Twitter followers because I'm doing this. I have no idea how dangerous this actually is. It'll be hilarious for us civilians to watch this because, uh, you know, uh, things go well. Hopefully, as they, I really hope that they do. Uh, and we have onboard cameras of these, you know, six or eight celebrities at one time going up and half of them passing out from the g-forces and the other half like throwing up oh it's going to make such great television um can't wait for that component of it but uh i i totally agree with you it's like it's still very much in its infancy and uh, it's it's exciting nonetheless but it's it's equally worrying yeah i would say so there's a uh, lot that can go wrong still and as far as the economy that also really plays into it a lot. Uh, you never know when there's going to be another crash and things have to reset a little bit. But what I find really cool is the experiment or the lo- the one pre launch that's planned out f- with this Japanese billionaire that SpaceX is doing, mm-hmm. where the whole idea is to bring up like he wants he doesn't want to just bring up you know other billionaires. He wants to uh, get money together to pay for like seven or eight artists to go up different kinds of artists musicians and painters and stuff just to have them experience it so they can try to be you know he he wants to inspire them to make some killer art and that idea brought me the first time i heard about it made me think about one of my favorite scenes in any movie which was during contact when the uh you know the whole movie is about this woman being sent into you know everyone thinks she's just going to be launched into space to meet aliens but uh she ends up going through this almost like a spiritual experience where it's like interdimensional or like some sort of wormhole she goes through Mm -hmm. and there's a part where she's floating you know in very low gravity and she's looking out into this nebula and she just says they should have sent a poet like she's tearing up saying they should have sent a poet and i always thought that was super awesome for them to put into the movie and it's yeah it's not <laughs> it's, it's not easy to, there's there's a definitely there's definitely a talent to relaying uh, that kind of beauty and stuff you're right yeah that is that is going to be a first isn't it because um we send astronauts who are engineers and pilots and it's not to say that they don't have an artistic uh bend to them or or capability certainly they do but it's not necessarily the thing that they've been primarily trained for you know they weren't um making ceramic plates and bowls prior to going into space they weren't painting a big canvas prior to going into space they weren't uh writing music prior to going into space they were training in like a, a water zero g simulator you know with a spacesuit on trying to repair a mock-up of like the hubble telescope that's what they were doing before they were going into space so they've got they've got like a primary mission focus they have like a militaristic uh, operational focus so for this japanese entrepreneur to be like let's set that aside and let's let's get some people who have really no idea what they're really going to be going into and and give them this once in a lifetime Uh, once in a generation perspective and see what they can make of it see how it changes their already well-developed artistic uh, outlook uh, and then share it with the rest of the world it's like that's amazing you know that's that's artistic evolution on a galactic scale and uh, it's exciting Um, I mean we we use that word a lot but it's cool to talk about this stuff and, and think of just what results will come of it yeah i think that's one of the best things um that any person can um, can have happen to them trying to get a wider view of the world uh the impact that that can have on your mind and your perception of 
what's going on. If uh, one video that I always recommend, and we'll kind of leave you guys with this. And thanks to those that are still listening. I love you. I'm gonna cherish uh, <laughs> the fact that this one's going on a little longer, and we're delving into subjects that aren't necessarily related to racing. But thanks so much for listening. So yes, thank you everybody. I w- we love you. I would like to say that Pale Blue Dot is uh one of the greatest books you could ever read for and sure there's this and carl sagan is just insane like the poet like he's he goes poetic as hell in that one and there's a video on youtube that brings like mo- it's a montage of all these different movies and it's so beautifully done it has a great soundtrack and it has carl sagan doing the n- narration because he did the audiobook for the book and takes clips of his audio and, and put, overlays them into this, all these different scenes of humanity and um, like profound moments in movies. And it's just so cool. And it really gives you inspiration to, to it gave me inspiration. It made me think, well, if, if only everyone could realize the impact of, or realize how small we are and like what, how profound it is that we're in this, insanely small spec compared to relative to the whole universe that it would hopefully inspire people to think that we're a lot closer to each other than we can we seem to be making it out with the isolationist and nationalism and all of that it's uh we're a lot we're super close to each other we're all very interconnected and um being able to see the entire world or trying your hardest to um, uh, get to that point in the abstract is really useful and helping you to be more chill with how things are going. <laughs> totally, dude. Totally. You know, borders are an illusion. And and if you're out in space, you realize the only border that really exists is the Earth's atmosphere. You know, the the circular shape of this beautiful marble floating in blackness and that perspective of how petty uh, our our wars and our differences are I wish everyone had that I wish everyone knew how pointless it was yeah and I don't think it takes necessarily going into space either like I said it's it's a point it's something to strive toward, you know, you're still going to get benefit, even if you don't reach that goal of getting to, you know, stand on the moon or whatever. Um, even going, you know, if you've never left your state, leaving your state, if you've never, um, had ambitions to travel just try your best to talk to other people in different parts of the world. And that's something that I really, uh, love about playing Gran Turismo is getting to know all these people. Like I've made good friends in Sweden and, like freaking Asia everywhere through the game. And I think it's something that's really, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Just a quick thing about that. Before going to Vegas, after having competed against all of these amazing racers, I, I was expecting them to be hyper competitive and standoffish and, uh, almost like they were miniature countries unto themselves with their own borders of conversation and ability to interact. And we got to Vegas and we got introduced and we started hanging out and the ex- exact opposite was proven true instead. Um, and guys like, yeah. like, like Nick and Jay and Nico and you like everyone was amazing super friendly we all wanted to be friends it, all it took was personal interaction yeah so it's that easy yeah, that that, uh, that that benefit of the doubt is just so valuable it definitely is well very well said and we're looking into the new year to hopefully in getting to experience that sort of thing again and bring everyone even closer together and build up the family to the point where we're all just uh 
yeah, like family. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. We want to get to the point where we all can help each other come back up from the downs and make the up the make the good moments even better. So, totally. so we we talked about a lot of uh, a lot of word association, and uh, there's a few things that we wanted to get to but didn't quite get to. It sounds like like. Uh, uh, you know, some Pinnacle updates, which is going amazingly, by the way. Everyone needs to look up Pinnacle GT and watch the last couple of rounds and, and keep an eye out for the the next round, which I think is uh, about a like nine days from now. Um, it's shaping up to be very competitive and extremely uh, highly uh, professionally put on uh, for its broadcasting and uh, racing quality. Um, and then we got like Porsche, we got Formula E, we got iRacing, um, there's a whole lot of stuff to go into, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you and I have uh, another podcast coming up after the um, these uh, quasi-pagan Christian holidays that we have <laughs> in front of us. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, I think Eddie, you already wished everyone um, you know happy holidays, but if you if I missed it or something like that, because I am three beers in, just three, you know, and and the the memory's a little vague, but happy holidays to everybody. Uh, wishing you like a happy new year. And uh, I I am very excited for the next Gran Turismo's episode. Episode six will be our next episode. I can't believe we're already six episodes in, dude. That's crazy. Yeah, we're and, in there. Um, I'm very thankful to uh, to do this with you. Me too. Thanks so much for sharing that, and I appreciate you, Tristan, for doing this along with me and getting better every time and trying to figure out where uh, what the whole process and uh, point of this whole thing is right now we're just having a lot of fun um shooting it out there and you know letting it be what it will be so yeah thanks for listening along and we promise to get better every time and uh, if there's any feedback at all that you have we we would really appreciate it it's, uh yes, bad and good leave any comments and, feedback you know if i'm clipping if i'm uh you know using too many words too many times if I'm saying uh too much I'd love to hear it <laughs> um same from you Eddie uh yeah. yeah there's there's that uh again it's I'm I'm working on it we're we're going to get there eventually er. <laughs> but uh should we should we have a sign out I have I have my uh my sign off for you ready my friend yeah we're ready to sign out and take it away 104.2 FM WRDZ Las Vegas if he's not spinning, he's winning. The handsome man who one day may lift off from Kazakhstan. Your co-host who smokes his toast with a coast-to-coast roast. Please give it up for Eddie, the Juarez Gomez. Thank you for listening. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. This has been a wonderful evening with the Gran Turismo Bros. Thank you very much.